ただいまより六本木。Ladies and gentlemen, now we'd like to start the culture and creative session two of this innovative city forum to commemorate the 10th anniversary of Rob Bongi Hills. Mori Memorial Foundation, Mori Museum, and Academy Hills have decided to organize this、uh, conference with the topic or the theme of new design for urban life. We have three perspectives advanced technology, culture, and creative, and urban development. We have the opinion leaders from all over the world. In this session, culture and creative session two, we would focus on the topic of aesthetics in the future as designed by innovation. We have about two hours for the discussion, and we are going to pursue the possibility of our lifestyle in 20 years. Now, I'd like to introduce the speakers in this session. First, we have Mr. Tim Brown. Tim Brown is the CEO and president of IDEO. As an industrial designer, he has received many awards, and he has been、uh, talking about the ideas of the design thinking as well as the value of the technological innovation and how the design thinking will change the organization. The Change by Design is his book, and he has written other books as well. We have Mr. Kenya Hara. Mr. Hara is a designer and also art director. He has been focused on the design of the products as well as design of things. He has、um, been displaying his work in the various exhibitions. He has written the book called Designing Design as well as White. He is the director of the Nippon Design Center as well as a professor at the Misashino Art Museum. University and at the head of the Japan Design Committee and Japan Graphic Designer,、uh, Vice Chair of uh, that uh, Japan Graphic Designer. We have Kohei Nawa. He is a sculptor and he is the assistant professor at the Tokyo Kyoto University of Art and Design. He has、uh, his own unique、um, idea of the Pix cell. In 2009, he started the Sandwich, which is a platform for creation. And he has done the exhibition in the Tokyo Metropolitan Modern Museum, as well as participating in the Aichi Triennale in the Setochi International Art Festival. We have Mr. Francois Bancon. Mr. Bancon is the Division General Manager of Product Planning Department of Nissan Motors. In 1999, he came to Japan and became the head of the perceived quality of the global design headquarters and also worked as a creative director of the marketing and communication group of the Zero Emission Division. Right now, he's the Division General Manager of the Product Planning Department and in charge of the global strategy of the Nissan brand as well as Infinity brand. Now, the moderator for this session is Fumio Nanjo, director of Mori Art Museum. Now, Mr. Nanjo, please. In 1997, Mr. Nanjo was a commissioner of Japan Pavilion of Venice Biennale, and also in 1998, the Biennale Commissioner for the Taipei and Turner Prize. And in 2001, he was artistic director of the Yokohama Triennale. In 2005, he was one of the judges of the Venice Biennale. In 2006 and 2008, in the Singapore Biennale, he was the artistic director. As an artist, art director, and also as an art management expert, he has written many books about the relationship between art and society. Now, this is the beginning of the culture and creative session two of Global Conference Innovative City Forum commemorating the 10th anniversary of Roppongi Hills. Mr. Nanjo, please. Good afternoon. This is right after lunch. So, 
maybe your brain is not functioning very well. But this is the second day and afternoon of uh, this innovative city forum. I'd like to briefly ask you, those of you who attended the conference yesterday, please raise your hand. I see. What about the morning session? Were you here? Thank you. About maybe less than half. OK, so based on that assumption uh, or understanding, I'd like to say that uh, this innovative city forum uh, commemorates uh, the 10th anniversary of Blopongi Hills and the Murray Art Museum. This is an international global uh, conference. As for the content, we focus on the cities, innovation, and creation. So innovation and also about the technologies, the issues of the new technologies in the area of the creation. It's art, design, architecture, fashion, including the various uh, creative industries, and also manufacturing or production has been the topic. Usually, we try to talk about each one of them separately, but in this forum, we have invited opinion leaders and experts, and we wanted to have a, a, a discussion with uh, different uh, uh, experts of the different areas. And it is said that the 60% of the people will be living in the city areas in 2020. So the, there are uh, the good things and bad things about the cities. And when we try to deal with uh, those urban um, problems, I think that, that this could be a very good uh, platform. So this is a culture and creative session too. Now this morning, we talked about we invited the people who were involved in uh, the city planning and building from the perspective of the culture. Now, in this session, we have uh, those people who are creators and uh, uh, those people who manufacture things. Japan is considered to be a, a superpower in manufacturing. And is it true? And there might be many questions in your head as you listen to the presentations. When you manufacture something, you create something new, but at the same time, you destroy something. When you make something, it's not just making something, but you're creating value and a new meaning. So how you live and the changes of the values, that are also linked to uh, this topic. So that is something that we would like to discuss in this session. And I would like to hear from the speakers. The first of all, I'd like to invite Mr. Tim Brown, who is the CEO and president of IDEO. Uh, Mr. Brown has uh, given a lot of talks in Japan and also is known for many books, especially the design thinking changing the world. So design will lead to the changes of the world. So I think that probably can be the um, start of uh, his presentation. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Tim Brown to the stage. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess we have a presentation coming up at some point. There we go, excellent. So um, design has been both hero and villain in the evolution of our cities and societies. It's been responsible for many of the things that have brought great beauty and, and, and uh, great nobility to our lives, but it's also been responsible for dehumanizing and alienating in many ways also. Uh, I guess what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, this afternoon is how I believe that design is evolving in the 20th, 21st century, how it's reinventing itself or being reinvented because of the circumstances um, in which we find ourselves. Uh, if we take the definition of design that was created by the great uh, scientist Herbert, uh, uh, Herbert Simon in the 1960s, he described design as 
everyone who, does, uh, who design, designs is somebody who devises a course of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. In other words, our desire to improve the state of the world around us is what causes us to, to uh, design. And we've, we've been designing for tens of thousands of years. The very first people who decided to craft tools to help uh, them live their lives were, in fact, designers. But what's emerged is really a sort of a single approach to what design is. As we've evolved over, uh, over the, uh, the, the centuries, uh, design has become perhaps perceived as being a, a more singular thing that's performed by an elite group of people um, in a very particular way. Uh, and the way, that way is this idea that we can somehow create a vision of the future, that our role of, as designers is to create a vision of the future and then cause that vision to come to pass, to exist. That works quite well in the situation of relatively simple things. So in this instance, excuse me, in this instance of a town square, we might imagine that we can do that, that we might imagine that indeed we can have a vision of how that town square or city square ought to be, and we can bring that vision to life, and we can imagine how that vision might play out over uh, many years, in this case, <clears throat> maybe more than 100 years. But we've discovered that when we move to things of more complexity, such as the city itself, that idea starts to break down. That idea that we can have a vision, a complete vision of what the city could be, and that we can then bring that city to life turns out not to be true. That approach to design turns out to fail at the large scale. Because large scale things are too complicated. <clears throat> They're too complex. We cannot possibly predict how everything um, will, um, w will happen. Uh, and, in a, and perhaps even more so in the 21st century, when not only are our systems large and complex, such as our cities and our economic systems and our social systems, but we have increasing amounts of volatility because of that complexity. So not only are they complex, but they're changing very fast and very often. <clears throat> so I think the challenge that we have <clears throat> is to move from a type of design that I would describe as being Newtonian. Um, um, this is Sir Isaac Newton, the uh, famous British physicist. Uh, and what he did was he described very simple rules to, um, that, when, that when we understand the state of a very simple si system, we can predict exactly what's going to happen in the future. And Newton's w rules, Newton's laws work very well at the simple level but they actually don't work at all well when things get complicated. Instead, I think we have to imagine design, instead of being top-down and predictive in the way that Newton would encourage us to think, instead, I think design has to, has to evolve to become something that's emergent and evolutionary and constantly changing, something that follows more of the principles of Charles Darwin, a sort of an evolutionary approach to design. And I think we can perhaps describe two metaphors or two activities in design that perhaps describe this shift from one to the other. If the blueprint uh, is, is an example of this Newtonian top-down approach to design, the blueprint is an attempt to describe every last finished um, decision about the design and freeze it in time, that we can think of as a Newtonian approach. Whereas code, in this case software code, is something that's emergent and evolutionary. It's something that determines a behavior but does not necessarily define the outcome. So what I'm trying to, to describe here is a shift in sentiment, a shift in mindset in terms of how we go about, uh, how we go about design. One important component of that shift in sentiment is I believe that we have to move from the notion of design being something that belongs to an elite, that's practiced by an elite, a, pro a professional elite, and instead one that has, in which design is embedded in every aspect of our culture and our society. 
we may still have and we will still have extremely talented master designers, but we have to have the tools of design available to everybody. Uh, we have to have the tools of design in order to operate within our lives. We have to use design as a skill just like we use literature, writing, mathematics, other basic skills and thinking skills um, in, our, in, our, in our lives. So we have to imagine how design becomes embedded in culture and in society. Uh, as Chris Anderson, uh, the editor of Wired magazine, put it a little while ago, if we're in a world where everybody is a designer, is forced to be a designer, then we need to find ways for everybody to get good at it. I believe one of the, the roles, indeed, of master designers is, in fact, to be teachers as well as doers. That we, we have to, we should be describing our ideas and our methods and our approaches in the world uh, so as to encourage others to do what we do as designers. And there are new ways of, of, of doing that. Teaching once was the master and apprentice, a very personal relationship, and, and that still remains an important way of teaching. But we have new ways of teaching because of new technologies. Uh, this is an example. We recently ran a design thinking program over several weeks uh, for social entrepreneurs and social innovators in which we had 5,000 teams around the world participate uh, in a design program, uh, all done remotely. So we have many mechanisms now for exploring teaching design and design thinking in new ways um, and embedding it in society. But there are other ways that this emergent evolutionary idea of design is beginning to appear and beginning to be important largely based on technology, largely based on a shift in the way that we communicate and the shift that way, the, uh, in the way that we act together in society, something described uh, very well by Stephen Johnson in his book uh, Future Perfect, where he talks about the rise <clears throat> of peer networks and phenomena such as the shared economy, where now instead of relying on a hierarchy between producer and consumer, we are now seeing aspects and, and examples in society and in, and in economies of us being both producers and consumers. Uh, this is often described as the sharing economy. This is one example of a sharing economy business, which is a rental car business, but where the cars that you rent is your neighbor's car. It is not a car provided by Hertz or dollar or any other car rental company, it is your neighbor's car who rents the car through a, an internet um, application. Uh, these, this evolution of the way that we communicate and the way that we interact is based on an evolution of the networks in which we use. Uh, our um, old industrial notion of networks are those that are on the left, net networks that are often centralized or slightly decentralized but still rely on this concentration of power, concentration of influence. But our networks today look like the network on the right. It's called a barren network, and it's the way in which the internet itself is developed and designed so that it's very robust, but it means every element on the network can speak to and interact with every other element. And it's this ability that we have to do that today through the internet that opens up new possibilities in terms of of how we interact and how we achieve things together. And it's having an impact on design. We're seeing new ways of designing emerge because of the existence of these networks. Um, and some simple examples, things like Pinterest, which has now taken what was once the uh, skill of the designer to use visual materials to inspire themselves and others, is now available to everybody. And so now we can get visual inspiration from a tool like Pinterest from many people all over the world. Or Kickstarter, which enables somebody who wishes to raise capital in order to do something creative to raise that capital very easily. No longer are we reliant on traditional sources of capital, venture capitalists, banks, investment bankers, or corporations. We now see individual creative people or small creative teams raising large amounts of money in order to compete directly with the world's largest corporations. 
So what we're seeing is the democratization of very many elements of the process of design because of these new kinds of networks. We see something like Etsy, which is um, a marketplace for people to sell and distribute their creative output. Again, it allows some craftsman or some designer in one part of the world to sell their products anywhere in the world. This was not possible just a few years ago. We have platforms like Code for America, which is allowing software engineers to gain access to open data solutions from governments and redesign the way we interact in civic society. So now we're having open source approaches to the design of government. We have open design platforms. This is one that we run at IDEO that's called Open IDEO, where we have 50,000 designers around the world participating in design challenges that are socially based, where we're finding that uh, very many different kinds of people with different insights and different skills can participate in different parts of the design process. It's opening up the design process to people in a way that's not been possible uh, before. And we're seeing new technologies in the way that we make things, 3D printing being one example, that's making it possible to change how we imagine the relationship between design and manufacturing. Now, whereas in the 20th century, design was often disassociated from manufacturing. Design happened, and then the design went to some part of the world where large-scale manufacturing brought that design to life. We are now able to connect design and manufacturing much more closely together. We're, we're able to iterate. We're able to go through the design and, ma and making cycle much faster, which means designs evolve faster. We get to new and interesting solutions more quickly. And we can imagine how to bring manufacturing back into our society and back into our culture in new ways. We're seeing new kinds of, of uh, manufacturing companies emerge. This is a company in the United States called Local Motors that is uh, uh, crowdsourcing the design of vehicles and then building micro factories to assemble those vehicles in small local factories to support and to serve small local ma uh, markets. So instead of having the car dealership in your local town, you have the car factory in your local town. We're seeing design emerge in the way that we think of the evolution of the fabric of our cities themselves. This, um, uh, this is an on the left, we might think of this as an example of, what, of the way design has played a role in our urban uh, infrastructure or our urban fabric, this notion of planning. But what we see on the right-hand slide is something that's a phenomenon that's emerged in, in cities, started off on the west coast of America, is now spread around the world, called placemaking, where local residents take over elements of their, of their urban environment and redesign them to make them places that are more valuable to the local community. And so the, by putting the, the tools of design into the hands of local residents, we start to see new uh, new uh, kind of urban fabric emerging that's not planned, it's emergent. And so we might think of this evolution of design from one that's been, that's one that's top down uh, based on Newtonian principles to one that's bottom up based on biological or Darwinian principles, very bit following very much in line with the evolution of our, of our economy over the last 200 years that if in the 19th century what we were doing was exploiting the machinery of the Industrial Revolution, and in the 20th century we were exploiting mass media to create our consumer economy, I believe that in the 21st century we have the opportunity to exploit these new tools of design, these new technologies, these new kinds of, of networks, and to, uh, 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 to end up with something that is, might be described and was described by the futurist Paul Sappho as the creator economy, and some, an economy in which we are all both designers, creators, producers, and consumers. Thank you very much. Very exciting 
talked about the new direction of design. I think the entire society move, is moving in that new direction. Uh, I think uh, this creator economy uh, concept will be supported by everyone here. Now I'd like to invite a representative designer of Japan, Mr. Kenya Hara. I think it was last year he uh, advocated the project House Vision in which he proposed that house is going to be the platform of design going forward. So, Mr. Hara. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Kenya Hara. Tim's presentation and his uh, uh, proposal, I fully agree. The roles of designers, I think, are changing. Creating brand conceptualization, of course, that's important. Uh, but uh, in a significant uh, point to visualize the potential, I think, is important. And uh, I would like to talk about this in more detail later, but uh, you have a great person, for example, like the days of metabolism, uh, to change things. That's the mood of the past. When someone discovers a new concept, uh, then society as a whole will transform. I think that's how cities change. So the theme is visualize and awaken to let people be aware. I think that's where the potential of design is. Mr. Nanjo. Uh, referred to House Vision, my project. That's one example. And La uh, Shita, uh, which is a uh, directory service uh, uh, in China. I like to talk about that. That's a new form of visualization. What is this? In 2009, Senseware. project uh, exhibition was held, very thin fibers, one seventh thousandth of a hair uh, is, uh, was put together for this uh, floor cleaner by Panasonic. It's a concept model. It uses the sensor uh, to clean and swipe the floor. And this is Nissan laughing car, smiling car. The cars would not collide anymore, but should uh, the cars be allowed to smile, I think the relationship is going to change as well. So this is another potential of fiber, and this is the logo, what I call the water logo. Water repellent uh, fiber uh, for the Senseware logo. Sometimes the logos are washed away. Uh, the injection needles are uh, hidden beneath uh, this uh, transmitter, and that's where the water comes. Uh, water can be very beautiful, like diamonds, if you can control it. So this is visualization. Visualization is like, what if? We don't know if that's true or not, but we're, visualization means uh, making things that you might think that is true presented in the way that is visible to you. And that's what I call visualization. And I realized one thing through this exhibition, state-of-the-art technology of Japan being used for this 
but we're not using traditional Japanese icons, and yet it was considered, it was called very Japanese. So I thought maybe we can do something entirely different using the traditional Japanese stuff. And I uh, focused on houses. And that's what this house vision is all about. I believe that houses could be a very important um, cross-section, um, mobility, aging society, aging market. I think they all is based on health, uh, which is the target of conventional beauty. Uh, we have been living in the same house, uh, same forms of house since World War II. Uh, and uh, people felt that this is investment, and that's why people lived in uh, the houses uh, that are very conservative. Uh, but we are living in the uh, country uh, with high technology where things change very dramatically. Well, the product is like a fruit of the tree. And what kind of interesting fruits we can get? That depends on the soil. Japan, economic and culture block is a very interesting one. And the car, which yielded as a fruit, which is different from European cars. And uh, we would like to yield fruits, houses as a fruit. This is education of desire, the latent desire to be surfaced, where design works. Therefore, design is education of desires. And housing literacy. That is, uh, ordinary citizens on their own create their living environment. Such ability is improved, then Japan will be a very interesting living in the cultural and economic region. That is a very important point. Well, Japan finally infiltrated, skeleton, built skeleton and the flexible interior. We can separate those two. And I would like to briefly touch upon the situation, 80s, 90s, 200s. The houses in, built in those er eras can be reused. So the buildings can be reused now. Well, Japanese, uh, this is ages of Japanese buildings, Japan. The whiter, the younger. So Japanese constructions are uh, younger. So it can be reused. And this is another interesting data. 50 years ago, 4.14 persons per house, including grandpa and grandma. 2010, 2.42. This is a national average. And number one is uh, living alone, and a couple is next. So those total of those two is uh, more than half. Tokyo has higher, even higher. Therefore, the content of a house has changed. changed. That is the current situation of Japan, and also the saving in cash. This is just the ordinary person, like uh, 800 trillion yen, yen or which are possessed by 50s, 60s years old people, as Mr. Masuda mentioned this morning. The large amount of savings to be spent in which market? Then houses could be a very interesting proposal. This is not a good cartoon, but the already existing uh, contents, it's like uh, if you convert the inside just as easily as you would with uh, one of those uh, local foods, then it will be very interesting. If you are not a cooker, it's just a sink and a refrigerator, it will be very convenient. You have never seen one like this before. But uh, any something like this can be accepted. What Doing something about the house is very risky, but currently the social network has been very developed. As long as you share information, it will not be risky. This will be accelerated. As was mentioned earlier, repeatedly, energy is like energy, mobility, and home appliances converted into houses. It is houses, the hub of that. And also senior, mature people, the new housing market. Not housing for family, but uh, the house for old people or health industry. 
and also home delivery services. Many things can come across with houses. Well, we have a disaster in, disaster in Fukushima. We have to be advanced country in terms of energy. So creating energy, storing of energy, and distribution of energy, what to do with it is a very important. But house will become the very basic base of that. That is the potential of houses. And mobility evolution. In Japan, the major car manufacturers are very great. But uh, personal mobility, they are conducting researches on personal mobility and elevator, escalators, the mobility which can ride on an escalator or elevator, if such evolution occurs, then that will change the living environment of a house. Personal mobility will change the shape of a house. And the complex composite houses, comp composite appliances, it's not as easy as just a simple thing, but uh, we take off our shoes at the entrance, and uh, there are many pieces interfaces with our body. And uh, life log can be logged from many aspects. How to share them, how to return such data. We have to think about the house as a field. Various professionals, based on the platform of a housing, then new things will be born. Well, housing literacy. The change in the awareness of a residence. Just I talked about soil. Well, shared information base in Japan is a very close sharing of information. Therefore, housing literacy will be accelerating. And uh, the later stage of life, the older people have a high level of knowledge and uh, awareness for beauty, and that's another driving force. And the operation of the resources of the awareness of beauty. Well, traditional Japanese beauty should be created for resources for the future. But the house is a place where you can express that uh, idea of beauty aesthetics. Therefore, as a national strategy, houses have to be thought about, not about cars. Of course, energy policy, we have to think about housing. And the real estate development, of course, it has to change interior and housing building methods, convenience stores and home deliveries. If we make a eye contact simultaneously, then the big potential for new industries. And then we conducted the uh, house vision exhibition. Exhibition is where people get together, and uh, they can try various things. And you can actually see those ideas. It's not the house possessed by, by uh, manufacturers. And they should collaborate with uh, architects so that uh, what if type of, it may not be new, but what if, what about this type of exhibition? The baseball field in Odaiba, I personally I rented this space, and house vision site was created. It's a venue. Kuma, the architect, constructed the venue, and these uh, lumbers were used. 1.5 by 10.5 times 10.5, and uh, it's like in a lumber field. It's therefore, floor and walls, it can go back to the original material. It's not even considered as rears. So just a temporarily, this was a storage place for these lumbers. But very beautiful venue was created. This auditorium is like a storage place for lumbers. And many people visited, of course, uh, Odaiba to attract people for like a paid event. But many people are interested in housing. This is a media day. And uh, I'm uh, using a loudspeaker. And Itotoyo and Lixo joined together to create a house nostalgic 
house, semi-open space is created for good ventilation and where you can barbecue. So tight fit together with the ventilation got together, like uh, placing a barbecue table inside of a house, such an idea. This is a traditional Japanese uh, house and going using such traditional ideas as well. Honda and Sosuke Fujimoto joined together to create this uh, house of mobility and energy. Well, mobility and house, of course, house will be the ma major battlefield for cars. The house can generate energy and store energy, and it is as uh, smart as that. And the three-layer system, very private space, as well as uh, someplace in between the outer layer, outermost layer is where EV can come in. This three-layer space, mobile, mobile robot stools, removable robot stools, and uh, you can ride on this if you have disability with your legs. And the unicab is waiting for you, it's just, be, just beside your bed. So smart energy is used for this type of uh, mobility. So seamless energy generation as well as consumption is joined in the environment of a house. This robot stool utilizing uh, technology from ASIMO, you can easily manipulate this. So it's already complete, which surprised me. Japanese car manufacturers have these advantages. And this one by Toyota Winglet, personal ro he's a manager of the personal robot section. He's become so skillful. And uh, if you use this, to get to the elevator or escalator, and the mobility itself will be changed. The Honda's house of energy and mobility. So it's easy to think of in terms of a house. Yamamoto, Riken, and Smith, and Naka, together with various companies, they form a society for future society study. One of the results that they obtained it's not a living with, it's a house for 500 people living together. Then large kitchen can be utilized and delivery system. Community of 500 people, the small economy will be born, which is different from the tough economy outside. More soft or softer economy can be born. And the model of one fifth is used relatively big. Like a small stores can be established, and if you go up the ladder, there's a private space, and outside it's just a small store. And the communal ba bathing space, and Sumitomo Forest, which, and Sugimoto Hiroshi, the modern artist, joined together to create a house of Suki how to utilize uh, traditional resources for future. This is what Mr. Sugimoto is good at. Very seriously, his key house, House of Suki, is renovated by pattern matching type of uh, combination. Well, this way of living is possible. Well, for those adults in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they love houses of suki, and that technology is preserved, therefore it's possible. And it is also popular with younger people, and uh, old material will be the material for future. Like hundreds of years ago, old uh, material can be used for future. Like uh, high pressure glass is used, and the tea ceremony room is recreated, and uh, young people are looking on, rather. And also Mujirushi, Muji, together with Shigeru Ban, proposed the house of furniture. Well, Muji has a very precise modules 
for storage, like storage and uh, equipment pieces. The not very tight pieces, so you can combine them to create a living environment. There are no walls and pillars because the furniture itself, structurally speaking, is functioning as a wall or a pillar or column. Therefore, there's no waste and uh, no danger of pushed over by the fallen furniture. This is a house of furniture which was proposed. And Toto and YKKAP, Narusei Inokuma, and uh, Makoto Azuma, the plant artist. This is a toilet. As you know, Japanese toilet is very hygienic. Maybe because we take off our shoes when we enter the house. And uh, further hygienistic uh, toilet. Probably the toilet will be the most hygienic space like inside of a hotel and also maybe we'll be changing the hotel and also the sense of value and the light and water is uh, given and the plant will grow so this in this environment so if you can mix those things uh, together you can create something very stimulating and mr masuda of Tsutaya, who spoke um, this morning and also, Tokyo R Real Estate got together to create a house like this. According to Mr. Matsuda, it's not the manufacturer or architect, but now the users have a power to edit their own houses. In the case of music and video, they are edited by the users, so the houses should be the same. So uh, it's not just showing the prototype, but we wanted to be able to show that the users can come up with the uh, very various ideas. This is a, a regular uh, sized house, and uh, there's a huge uh, table, and there's a kitchen over there, and the children can uh, do their homework. So you don't have to separate them into small uh, rooms, but rather it can be one big space. So you might have a different hobbies. So free, very free um, way of uh, editing uh, your own house. So the skeleton, you can get the skeleton and you can freely edit your own um, house. So how do you make the users more aware of this? And if people become more aware, I think that maybe we can create something totally new with the Japanese houses and design it needs to function as an education. We have two sessions per day. Sugimoto san, Ito san come to speak, and uh, we can hear a very enthusiastic uh, sessions. So, just listening to this session uh, could be considered as a educational, and there are more than 40 uh, sessions that we had. And I was a moderator of most of the sessions, so I quickly learned many things. So that's um, uh, how activities expanded. So as a result, it was a three-week exhibition. And the motor show has supported or uh, stimulated the economic growth. And I think it was an equivalent uh, type of the platform that uh, we created focusing on the houses. It's not the manufacturers or the companies who are taking the lead, lead but rather the people who live or the users can get involved. So as I said at the beginning, the regular people can think of ideas. Their houses, they can create their own houses. So when they become aware of that, I think we can move to the future society. Another thing, I'd like to speak uh, five more minutes. And in China, this is the project that we are doing. This is called Dashi La and Tianmen uh, Forum at the edge of it, 1.5 kilometer by 1.5 kilometer. This is the whole area. And uh, I was given the commission to make a plan for this. Yang Wei Chu Street is this one. This one, this is a Yang Wei Chu Street. And and I was given 
the um, uh, the assignment to make the, the planning, and and I try to do this 3D uh, images of this street. So you can actually take a look at this street from anywhere. So I created this, and when you create an application, you can just use your fingers to move uh, this around, and. You can look at uh, those uh, houses and buildings from the all the different uh, angles. So this is the application. And uh, this is the Chinese um, um, the ink, uh, red and uh, white. And I created a map. And in the map, this application using this map can be um, embedded into the smartphone. This is a street view. So the same 3D view, uh, you can look at it from the different angles. So if you click, you can get more information. I think it would be easier for you to see the video. So you can pinch in, pinch out, and you can rotate it, you can change the angle. So G there is a GPS, so where you are and which angle can be seen. And if you touch or click, you can get more detailed information. So. Of the Jin Empire was movie or the video can be also embedded. So street view can be seen. And the Google map is very well made. If the Google map tries to cover the all the globe, this is more like a local uh, little reader. And this is the system that uh, we built. Now, this can be applied to different areas. It can be uh, used as a guidebook or a handkerchief or scarves or wrapping paper and a coaster for the bars. And you can actually show where you are on this uh, map. So, of course, uh, the signage system was what I was uh, uh, assigned to uh, make. So this is a signage uh, system. This is uh, just like a huge iPhone. So th this is a still picture, but uh, theoretically, uh, you should be able to shrink and enlarge uh, the map on the screen. But as for the sign, or, um, this is uh, just a still picture, but the application can be linked to this. So inside the historical building, uh, we have this kind of uh, signage. And when we have something like this, what happens is that uh, it's not just an inconvenient uh, instruction, but uh, the future of uh, the town uh, can be seen. There are many historical uh, buildings and their design offices, cafes, and restaurants. Without breaking uh, the old buildings, you can take advantage of them, and you can go into the inside of it. And so the, this zone as a whole with the historical buildings, it is the asset. And people are becoming more aware of that. So as I said, rather than showing the overall plan, but those visitors or people who live can become more aware of the importance of what they have. And that would create uh, the future for them. So. In the past uh, two years, I have been involved in this project. So um, little by little, I think we are enriching this application. And uh, this is uh, working better. And I feel um, satisfaction from that. And I touched upon the house vision earlier. And so the regular people feeling that, that they can create their own houses. So when they become more um, active, I think that will lead to the change in the society. Uh, so 60 people, 60% 60 of the people will live in the urban areas in the future. So we have to have a future in the cities, and we have to do something in Japan. So in order for that to happen, Japan should take the leadership to change itself so that we will have a future. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in front of us, but each one of the challenges, I believe, are opportunities. So what do we do with them? We have to visualize the future, and we have to generate uh, the uh, awareness. So visualize and awaken. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you for your attention.
どうもありがとうございました私 Thank you Yes, I went to the house vision exhibition I thought it was like an architecture exhibition but as you go in it was not like looking at the architectures but looking at the lifestyles so that was the exhibition and there is a design factor or aspect but there is also a system or products so various something old and something new and also as I said now Japanese government is trying to promote the Japanese products under the uh, theme of uh, cool Japan uh, 50,000 100,000 different products are included but the, what is the core of those I think that is the sense of beauty uh, in Japan aesthetics so the sense of uh, aesthetics so I think that Mr. Hara uh, also talked about that okay so next uh, I'd like to call upon Mr. Kohei Nawa Mr. Nawa in 2007 uh, he received a word of the culture award in Kyoto and Roppongi crossing in uh, the Mori uh, art museum he received a special award then So Mr. Nawa has been very uh, active as a Japanese artist and also he's a sculptor and uh, the, he's trying the different methods, for example, using the digital tools, new technologies uh, utilized for his work. So Mr. Nawa, please. Good afternoon, Kohei Nawa. Right now, I create a sculpture in Kyoto and in the art field, trying to emit uh, messages. And five years ago, I established a studio called Sandwich. And there, in the past four or five years, I have uh, been engaged in more than 100 projects. So art is the core or the center. There's architecture, design, video. So various outputs are something that I'm creating. And at the same time, the, there is a simple residence facility. So uh, young artists from all over the world have started together. Kyoto, there are six art museum, uh, art universities. So there are students uh, from those art uh, universities gathering. So we have an educational aspect. So I'd like to share with you some of the activities as well as uh, some of our works. This is Fushimi area of Kyoto. There's a studio. The sandwich is the name, and this is gray. It used to be a sandwich uh, factory, actually. <laughs> Yamasaki Bread used to make sandwiches here. So we renovated this. So this is where we um, have our projects. About 40 people work here as an office, and there's a project management office, also art projects are going on. So there's a pr production team as well. And this has also become the architectural office. So the houses and the museums, we are working on those architectures. We take pictures and we use the graphic technology. So there is a graphic team. So uh, the uh, new art output technical um, development and also the material research is something that we do. Kishinya Shinoyama, the photographer, came. So I myself continue to uh, work on those uh, sculptures and the works. 
And there are also other projects and various technologies and the material manufacturers come here for the meetings. So this has become a major platform. So on the uh, flat space, we have our students, artists, architects, designers. They get together in the same place to eat together. So we think together, we come up with the ideas and create together. So as we do this, even when we are doing the art project or architectural project, we are just right next to each other. So we stimulate each other and our ideas stimulate each other. So it's more efficient. 40 to 50 different small projects and large projects are going on at the same time. So it's uh, very busy. In the past four or five years, when I look back, my memories are quite uh, mixed up because of all those uh, projects. Now about my own work, the word cell. Uh, <coughs> cell means uh, various uh, different things, but uh, our body is made of cells. And what we make and in the material world, we have uh, cells. So understanding the world from the perspective of the cell and to consider a work or the product as a continuation of the cell. And this has a close affinity to the human body and this can be well connected to uh, what we do. So. This is the word that we use. So since 10 years ago, we combined the word picture and cell, and we created the concept of the pixel, uh, pix cell. So in the computer uh, area, uh, there is a box, a box cell or the volume cell, and also texture cell or text cell. Those are also very interesting from the sculpting perspective. Element of the pixel. Of course, pixel because of picture elements, but picture and cell, pixel would be for the sculpture concept. This is the pixel sculpture. Motifs collected over the internet is the subject. Uh, this is deer. And uh, we have crystal glass uh, cubes placed on the surface so the object could only be viewed through a lens. And uh, our eyes are a lens as well, so we are looking at the world through a lens with a digital camera becoming more popular. Everything, the surface of everything could be replaced by digital representation, meaning that on the surface of the planet Earth we'll have more lenses and the information obtained would explode. So digitization and pixelization are the artifact of our sensitivity becoming closer to our body. So initially, you might think that it, it's going far from our body, but actually it is getting closer to the mechanism, the principle of human bodies. So pixel uh, can be applied to sculptures. I've been doing this for more than 10 years. About 700 motifs have uh, been converted into these. And uh, these are the beads placed on the computer cell. So that's pixel on pixel. And this is prism series. Within one cell, one motif is included. The surface is covered with prism sheet. Motif is inside, but it could seem like two or it might disappear. So although it is there, it could be viewed only as an image. You can't touch it. That's the reality, is what I was trying to create here. And here, Inside the box, silicon oil is contained, which is uh, emitting the white light. And if you see it from the top, you see bubbles. Silicon oil 
is used uh, to uh, erase bubbles in the industrial application. Uh, it's uh, a liquid where bubbles will disappear very quickly. And uh, we are injecting oil at fast speed, so you get bubbles in a grit manner, but it has the property to erase uh, the uh, bubbles. So you're going to see a sort of capsules, layers of bubbles. So it appears as though you're looking into a monitor when you see it from the top, but there are matters, and there's a texture of silicon oil. And molecular-wise, uh, silicon oil is like a halfway between the organic and inorganic matters. So it appears as if, or it feels as if it is, you are in one, your body is in one with the outside. And this is the uh, foaming polyurethane. Uh, when you go to shopping malls or industrial uh, facilities, uh, you see many displays and objects uh, in the entertainment facilities. Uh, as a university student, I had this part-time job of creating those. And uh, they look very hollow, uh, quick, and dirty. It was the uh, FRP type of uh, objects being created at very speed. So it's very void in terms of surface. And uh, we see more and more of these in urban settings. And uh, it, it's like it is uh, expanding. So scum, uh, like a scum of a soup. And this is another example. And here, using 3D technology, uh, I am working on sculptures more recently. So you do the scanning on 3D, convert it into voxel data, which turns into sculptures. This is a very simple program. The program itself was developed within our studio, scanned data are projected. And uh, like drawing, we put many markings on the surface contracted or expanded to get a more abstract sculpture. This is a solid aluminum being sculptured to a real size sculpture. The deformed body and the real body put together. And this is a seven-year-old girl. The surface has a brush strokes sort of melting like a soft ice cream texture. And this three-year-old, four-year-old boy and girl, chocolate, peanut chocolate type of uh, surface, bumpy. It's 2.5 meters high, so this was a rather dynamic one. And this one, Korean band called Big Bang. Top is a member of that band, and he was the client. And uh, this uh, art a player, a musician, was converted into this art. Holding a gun, we scanned that, and with a stroke, very strong stroke, we converted that into a sculpture. Depending on which direction you're looking at it from, the color changes. So. The object is there, uh, but uh, it exists as information, so to speak. So that's what I was trying to create here. And this is from the spring of this year on a small island called Inujima in the Japanese Mediterranean. Biota is the name of this project. I have a video I'd like to show you. This is the Japanese inland sea. Very small island called Inujima. The population, 45. Average age, 75 years old. Uh, it's a very deserted community. And uh, this was part of the Seto Uchi Triennale. Uh, aimed at revitalizing the community through art, 
and economy. Kazuo Sejima designed this uh, within this old house. Uh, we ha had our works of art, and this is Biota or Biota. Architecture and sculpture combination was new experience for me, but uh, personally, uh, since I became interested in architecture as well, this was a very good, very important opportunity to think about the potential of architecture and sculpture. Uh, this is the center, very uh, spacey uh, area, white, bubbly object representing uh, the essence of matter, like an entropy. The matter is trying to become three-dimensional, and yet it can't, so it almost collapses. And then a strong light uh, is uh, emitted, and uh, so this uh, matter is trying to transform itself toward that light, like a big bang. And you can create this manually, but to adjust to architecture, uh, to have the spatial coordination, I created uh, in a 3D manner the dextral uh, device was created where I could actually touch the inside of this program. There are two tibonia outdoors, fauna garden, and flora garden. Two gardens uh, focusing on animals and plants. So from the sculpture or the object it, at the center, the light, gravity changes takes place, and new life form are created on those two gardens. Could be boys, could be deer representing a messenger from a deity, which will have the spirits being injected coming out of the ground. This is the flora garden, the plant garden. Inujima is an island where you find many minerals when you're walking around. And uh, minerals have very interesting, attractive texture. And mineral and mineral energy coming out of the ground. And new plant existence and presence being born. Could be Earth, could be some other planet. As the symbol of life, plant was created. So and after this Inujima project, following this experience, uh, there was another project that was very important to me uh, this summer called FOAM. In Aichi Triennale, uh, which is still ongoing for another 10 days or so, at Narahashi site, we, I created this installation. In the Inujima uh, project, uh, I thought about the flora and fauna. When organisms are born on Earth as they evolve, and when I think of that process, I want to. I got interested in the uh, primordial form. You can hear the foam sound. Foam is bubble. And this woman is walking. It's a rather round, large area, dark, and on the ground, dark rocks are laid. And when you walk on top of that, the foam objects expand in front of you. Uh, this was a very analog product using technology. Uh, maybe this could have been done 100 years ago. So the installation itself is rather old as well. Very analog method being used here. And the uh, 
ってないぐらい成長する。Surfactant and foam, and you said the perfect ratio was pursued so as to grow the foam every day. And as you walk in, you encounter this gigantic matter. Which almost gives you a feeling that you walked into a different planet, not Earth. So, a primordial thing being born, your existence. What is cell? Those questions come to your mind. For me, this was. Almost a combination of、uh, all of the previous projects. And finally, but not the least,、uh, there were many large projects that were worked on this year prior to the Aichi c h i n a l e I、uh, placed a very large installation in Korea outdoor. Uh, the largest one that I've ever worked on、It、took me two years. 3D technology was just being applied. And in Korea, the decision was made that this will be made. And when we were moving this from Japan to Korea, it was when this was flying on the airplane uh, that uh, earthquake. And tsunami disaster March 11 occurred. So, this is an outdoor installation、uh, placed in the middle of a city. So, the relationship between the city and humans, the welfare, energy, how humans can work on the artifact, and how that can. Turn into a thread when the balance is lost is what I was trying to express. That 3D system shown on the left hand side, that's a device that was used. On a computer graphics, it appears as a normal graphics, but we are using a large tool. So、uh, you can connect to the digital plane. So it's almost like using a clay. So, we can create、uh, these things in the computer. It is digital and also tactile feeling and physically conforming while sculpting. If this is possible, then any size, very big to very small, we can create a thing called sculpture. So, I felt that type of potential. That means this can be deployed into architecture or microscopic or nanotechnology. Or sculpture in a microscopic level can be made. This is a sculpture called manifold. In this case of a manifold, 13.5 meters high, 16 meters wide, 12 meters deep. That's the size. It's like a construction piece. And、uh, it's not a level that you can actually feel. It's like a big statue of Buddha in Nara. Very gigantic. One, I was thinking that way, but、uh, not only being iconic, but、uh, you go th through underneath, it's a sculpture that you can experience with this volume, the smoothness, or moving sculpture, or dynamism. I've never seen one like this before, so that's what I was trying to build. Like models, computer simulation screens, I carefully consulted them. This manifold relationship between the people and the manifold, energy going out of the ground and then changing, it's like dancing. And、uh, suddenly, this type of thing appears in the middle of the town. And,、uh, How this will influence the people's inspiration and image. That's what I'm hoping to see. In this way, art, like a 
not only to deal with the technology in front of you, but in the past, present, and future. It's a big scale to connect them. So media art, in a bad sense, we are not limited to just media art. And the meaning of media changes as well. And together with the development of technology, or advancement of technologies, people's awareness and the potential of forming, like 3D printer, such potential will be increasing. Not only ease of use on the part of the user, and also by that technology, what can be realized? Though those are two separate things. Therefore, not only using technology, but uh, technology was born f for what purposes and for which usages will bring this to a new direction. The artists and creators, they should uh, lead that way. And Kyoto from Kyoto Studio, I showed you three pieces of work this year we made. Well, creator, architecture, art, and design, all inclusive. From the perspective of creator, what we can do, there are more things that we can do. For example, architect was the, has the role to create something, but this type of a forming and the structural computation and simulation technology advancement, the traditional architecture can be regarded as models and technology to realize what has been built. And next is what to build, when, how, with what approaches, like uh, to be incorporated into a society or a city. And that is a very important aspect. Well, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Well, that was a very big scale sculpture that you showed us. Lastly, Mr. Francois Banken, Nissan, Communication Group, General Manage, uh, Division General Manager and Product Planning Department. He used to be in Renault, Renault and he was an artist in southern France. Maybe he will not be touching upon that, but uh, Nissan's vehicles and transportation and the new ideas or vision for car will be presented, please. Uh, good uh, afternoon. <coughs> so I, I think all the explanation and the presentation we had right now uh, show very clearly that something gonna change. Uh, as it was said, uh, about 60% of the population of the planet going to live in city in 2020. So there is no way we have to change something. Uh, so I'm just, I'm not going to make a long presentation. Uh, just with, I did select three keywords or three triggers who may help to think about the city of tomorrow. The first one is space. The second one is zero. And the third one is freedom. And uh, just to mention, I'm going to talk about mobility. Mobility is just a small part in the story uh, uh, of the city. Let me move to this. Yeah. So the, the first, uh, uh, space is a big issue in the city. I mean, uh, I don't know if you did travel all around the world, but when you go in India or in some more emergent country, you can understand there is a problem there. Uh, the footprint of mobility must change in the future. I mean, basically, to give you a picture, and even as a car maker, it's a risk for us, people buy a five to six meter long car to move alone and in a very short trip. Something is wrong. And uh, what's going to change in the future, probably, is people shifting, going to a more, let's say, smart mobility. I'm going to use what I need and just what I need if I'm alone or two people with some uh, uh, something to carry. And this is a big... Uh, uh, big story for the future, the, the, the personal mobility, let's say, uh, let's call this car, 
going to have to connect with uh, uh, public transportation, buses, trains, bicycles, e everything around. This is already, by the way, Tokyo is a kind of advance for this because this is, to my knowledge, the only city in the world where public transportation works and works well. Uh, so you can possibly imagine that in the future, in a new city uh, structure, people are going to be become smarter and the car provider, the car maker, going to be also forced to be smarter, providing the right thing at the right time. <coughs> and it's not done yet. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, maybe I switched the wrong. OK. So this is a video just to show you. That was an experience we did with Mazda. When we talk about cities, there are many different cities in the world. Some are old and historical, like Paris, London, and some are Tokyo, and some are new. Uh, Mazda is a, is a city, a tentative of building a, a brand new city from scratch in Abu Dhabi. And uh, we were asked to kind of help them to figure out what can be the mobility in this very new environment. So the, the video didn't work very well, but basically that was a what we call the last mile mobility, when you have a kind of very individual mobility, actually two people, uh, mobility, who can interact with pedestrian and the city around. This is not anymore a car, which is closed, uh, which is a given. Uh, it's something which is uh, what we call uh, interactive with, with, uh, with the environment. The second keyword is zero. Zero stands for zero emission. I mean, you don't need to be very visionary to understand that we have a problem there, uh, especially in a city. Fortunately, in some areas, especially, for example, in London, uh, the, the, the government, the people in charge of the city are helping us uh, because they create some congestion charge that force people to move only with zero emission mobility. And I think that's going to extend all over the world. Uh, there are already some experiences in Tokyo and Yokohama about this. Uh, and some more to come. So zero is going to be the key. We have to be zero emission, but this is not enough. We also have to take into account the all energy chain, which, believe me, is not that clean at the moment. When I say energy chain, it's from the basic energy to the plant, the monozukuri, production, and, of course, usage for, for the customer. But there is no big uh, story there. The, the, the future of the, zero, of the city is going to be a uh, carbon, free carbon uh, uh, environment. Uh, and that's going to be true for the car, but that has to be true for the houses and any public building. And believe me, we are very, still very far from this. The, the third one, the third keyword is freedom. Mobility, especially car, individual mobility, used to be about freedom. Freedom to move, free, freedom to meet people, to connect, that was a big story uh, when you look in the US, for example, where car has a kind of, uh, uh, is a kind of foundation of the country regarding the way people interconnect. And, uh, and freedom must not disappear. Even if we go to a very personal robotic mobility, freedom remains the key. There will not be about freedom of driving like crazy uh, anymore, probably, for most of the people, but freedom of sharing freedom of connecting uh, uh, and freedom of uh, meeting people uh, are going to be something we have to take into account. Uh, and on this, uh, uh, Tim was talking about sharing, whether it's organized sharing by company or, or a personal private initiative, which is going on, by the way, all around the world. Uh, car sharing is going to be a big, big thing to happen, uh, which is a very smart and clever way to optimize uh, let's say, the pollution of the, of the mobility in a city. And let me show you a small video that we did. This video was about London. When London was preparing the Olympics, we did image in a car uh, where the target was not so much the people living in a city, but the visitor. And you know for the Olympics, you have many visitors. That's going to be the case in Tokyo very soon, so <laughs> we have to ask ourselves. So this idea was, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what we call now a very trendy word uh, called autonomous car. 
and you know we are committed to deliver autonomous car very soon, uh, and autonomous car more than safety or more than uh, technology has something about uh, to do with freedom. I mean, you can do many things in a car. Basically, in a world, I don't know the exact, nu exact number, but 75% of the time, you are not moving in a car. You are just stuck in traffic jam. This is, uh, this is terrible. Uh, so if we can improve, if, if technology can improve this, uh, uh, going to multitasking in a car, uh, making some clever thing in a car with no risk because the, the safety remain uh, for the mobility a big, uh, a big story. So this is going to happen. We are... Uh, we target to provide uh, this kind of thing about 2020, uh, starting probably with Japan, where the regulation might be more, uh, let's say, open to this kind of initiative. So that was that. I didn't present you any solution here. That was just to stimulate the conversation and uh, open the field for questions uh, in addition so, to all what was, uh, has already been said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I would like all the panelists to come up onto the stage. The speakers, please come up onto the stage. Well, various presentations have been made. I wonder whether I can summarize them. But rather than summarizing the discussions, we would like to have a discussion among ourselves and ask questions to each other. After listening to these presentations, probably you have questions and something that you were impressed with. And I would like I would like you to discuss among yourselves. So please think of your questions as well. Well, I myself, I have several questions, but uh, the moderator tends to ask questions. But rather than the moderator, but we would like to open up the floor for discussion later on. So if you come up with a question. Please remember your question. Okay, so Tim, now starting with you, you listen to the other people speak. What were your impression? Anything that you'd like to comment on? I'm sure that you have a very wide ranging view. I, I found uh, all of the uh, the work that we were that we were seeing extremely inspirational, um, and it's interesting to see how these various ideas sort of in, interact. You know that uh, that cities of the future require us to participate in new ways, uh, but we are finding ways to express ourselves through and with new technology that are surprising, and we need deep creativity and 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 designed to discover those new forms of ex expression, which, in, which then go on to inspire all of us to mm. behave differently and do different things. Um, uh, the way that we interpret the city, the way that we interpret our, uh, our own environment, uh, the way that we participate in our own environment, um, not just from a behavioral sense, but from an aesthetic sense, which I think is, uh, is really powerful. And, and, I, and I, you know, I, I believe that in, in some ways, uh, proliferating this idea of engagement uh, from, a, from a behavioral sense is maybe not so hard, but the, the, the task of, of kind of educating and sharing and proliferating from, the, from an aesthetic sense is maybe quite difficult. And uh, it needs inspirational leadership to do that. And that's maybe the role for, uh, 
for that design elite that I was talking about still to play is that inspirational role, that, that opening up of possibilities, that, um, that pointing out of possible new, uh, new destinations. So no, I, I found it, it all very inspiring. Well, yesterday morning, Heizo Takenaka, professor, asked many questions to the audience. And during that session, in order for the cities to improve themselves, the freedom, is it freedom or is it leadership? Which is more important? That was one of the questions he asked. For the city development and the building of the city, it's very important. Then Kofas said that the infrastructure needs to be done by the public sector, and the rest should be free, or so the users can do whatever they want. But the roads, uh, the energy, have to be built by the public sector. So that was one of the solutions. In fact, manufacturing is similar. It can be applied to various um, areas and sectors. So as you said, design, is it going toward the democracy? Or elitism, do we still need the elite of our directors. Mr. Hara, what do you think? Well, I think both. But from my perspective, what I talked about is the cities are the topic today. So, well, the other day, I went to see the metabolism exhibition to find out how the architects in the past uh, tried to build things, and I checked on the scale and so forth. But the young architects are thinking about totally opposite. So they're looking at, for example, very small thing, like a mode. They're interested in something very small. So architectural perspective, but rather than the architectural perspective, I think that the wisdom of the people who live, I think, is what we need as a standard. So planning, building, or making, rather than that, I think awakening people is more important. Everything is designed. There's nothing which is not designed. Uh, Tim Brown, you showed us uh, the, uh, the, the storm tool. And that was the beginning of our design. The storm uh, was the beginning. And that's the symbol of the tools. And for example, the Buddha statue uh, with the hands like this uh, was also discovered at the same time uh, to, um, uh, to drink water with hands. So those roots of the different tools have evolved. And I think that's how we um, evolved. And uh, I think that the human being is the only one who tried to change the environment. But what is the design? I think building the environment as a whole is a design. So in the wide sense, and also the microphone, for example, or the, uh, the, the napkin and uh, the uh, container, everything is designed. So as soon as you notice that, I think that you would notice that all the uh, wisdom of the human being are accumulated and utilized. It's not just the specialists, but the people in general notice that uh, there are a lot of hints in the uh, glass. And there's an intention, there's a planning, there's a desire, and there's carefulness. Everything is included. And if as soon as you notice that meaning, you would look at the world differently. So. Um, I think we move on to the next dimension as soon as you notice that. So how do we awaken people and to educate people in a good sense about the freedom? Design is not for the controlling the, uh, the overall picture, but how to lead people into uh, the awareness. And I think that the design should play such function. I think the design, uh, the human being is the uh, the, um, the being who uh, organize. So what do you think, uh, Mr. Bangkong? Now we jump into the idea of uh, democracy. Uh, 
I think especially when we talk about city, uh, democracy and city are very well connected. Major part of our history is about city and democracy or political movement. Uh, and fortunately, now we have the tool to make this happen. Uh, about the, the difference between the top-down execution or decision, whatever they are, designer or architect or artist. Uh, and I think Nawasan showed very well how we use a digital technology to redefine what sculpture is about. And I think maybe digital technology in general is going to redefine the city under the condition that we make the people do this rather than us Probably we need some guide or some support. But there are many micro-initiatives now. Uh, Tim show, uh, showed one of them, where people take control of the story. And this is the city of, to, of the future. They're going to take time. Uh, they're not going to happen tomorrow morning. But I think we have a unique opportunity to give the, the, the very advanced digital tools in all meaning, uh, uh, fortunately being useful rather than gadget and, uh, and uh, game. Mr. Bankon, well, going back to democracy, what happens when you create a car with a democracy? Say that everyone designs different cars. Those of you, those people who, well, rather than buying their uh, designed car, they can create their own cars. Do you think that kind of uh, thing would be possible and that would happen in the future? We, we are working on this. We're going to display very soon for the Tokyo Motor Show a kind of experience, live experience about uh, we call it co-creation, having community, not everyone, but some community, large community, involved in a process of making car. Not in the process of decorating the car at the end, but being in control from the beginning, from the ID, uh, uh, up to the end, uh, and probably the, the, the end item going to be not uh, 100 or 1,000, which is almost uh, uh, unfeasible, but a couple of uh, direction where people can, uh, let's say, be close to. They, this is a very difficult thing. There are some people who are doing local motors, is one example in a very small uh, and not so well done scale. Uh, the problem in our uh, industry, the, 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 the weight of the regulation is very heavy. So you have to, people, you have to fix this for people. People are not necessarily engineers. So we have to give them a skeleton which is, uh, let's say, compliant with any regulation and let them do the rest. That should be at least the first step to go. Mm. Mr. Hara? Oh, yes. I'm very interested in cars myself. So customizing cars, rather than that, if there's a democratic aspect into the mobility, there's no way of thinking of this is my car. In other words, well, uh, umbrella is my umbrella, but it could be a public umbrella that everybody can use. So you don't think that this is my umbrella. You would just rent, the, sorry, the used umbrella whenever you need at the station. So if something like that happens, you will lose the awareness of your own umbrella. And the mobility is the same thing, I think, to some extent. What do you think? Well, the way of thinking, I think, uh, needs to be changed fundamentally. Maybe that time is coming, that is to say, uh, owning something, dominating energy, dominating products. If it's not yours, it's not mine, it's yours. That kind of way of thinking needs to be changed. Sharing everything uh, with other people, cars, energy, and um, sharing it for the, uh, the purposes. One thing is that the car is for to be driven, so maybe half of that would be for that. But sometimes the car will take you to somewhere while you are sleeping. So that uh, is a kind of futuristic uh, thing. Tim, do you have anything to add on that point? I think we're actually, it's actually part of, a, of an ongoing evolution that's been going on since before the Industrial Revolution, that we've constantly looked as a society for ways to make more productive uses of the resources that we have, because that's how we create wealth. 
It's how we improve our economies. And so this idea of collaboration, this idea of sharing, is, uh, is just another way of making more productive use of the resources we have. It's just the next step. Who knows what the steps beyond that will be? And, um, and, and it's a way of creating more value out of the same amount of stuff, or maybe even less stuff. Uh, so it's, it seems to me it's an entirely logical extension of everything that's gone before. Mm. Well, in the case of art, Mr. Nawa, if you like a certain art, the collectors would purchase and they would just collect the arts. But the listening to other people speak, what do you think? Sharing something. Well, the way of making things would change. So in the 20th century, or modern art, the artists themselves created arts. So you stayed inside of your studio and worked alone. So your own experience and your own thinking were reflected or made into products. That's the painting and sculpture. That's how uh, the art developed itself. But now there are so many people who have tools to express themselves. And there is also communication tools. So your own feeling or self-realization or self-expression It's not the art that uh, you are creating alone. If you try to pursue the self-expression, it's not doesn't mean that you become the artist. So how you express yourselves or expression themselves will become something different. So I teach at the uh, art museum, uh, art university. There's something, the work that created by the students. They are artistic because there are a lot of references that they have in the past. In the art uh, history, uh, they learn a lot of information and they get the inspiration and they create their work. But if you, if that is the only thing, you don't see anything new in their students' work. So something that were called art in the past uh, is just uh, reproduced in that process. And that would make the, the world of the art very narrow a market. I think same thing can be said about the market. So the artist, I think, needs to use their body as a catalyst and use uh, the technologies or to work with other people of the other uh, arena and work together with what is happening in uh, the uh, world and to react to it. And by doing so, you can create something new. So I think that is the most important thing. So the way of thinking about art or possibility of the art is not something that is exhibited in the museums. Art innovation. So I think it relates to the innovation of art itself that gigantic sculpture in Korea in a public space, right? When you placed it, the people who saw it, in a way, I think it will be shared by many people. What impact is it, uh, or were you expecting to see amongst the people? I did not have any short-term view. When I was uh, given that project, I was told that, uh, imagine that it's going to be there for 300 years. It's not 20, 30 years, 300 years. It's almost like a ruin, archaeological ruin. I'm not going to be there anymore. Political system, national system, state, concepts of those institutions are going to change as well. So something universal was the only approach that uh, uh, was uh, valid. And at the same time, I was creating it today in this contemporary world. And that was my answer. So today, the reaction is that uh, something strange all of a sudden appeared in the middle of the street. So people are taking pictures. So people are curious. Uh, maybe that's just about the only reaction that we see today. But 
over time as it becomes a monument or as it becomes a part of archaeological ruin, maybe people are going to think about uh, what thought was behind it. And I'm hoping that that's what people will be thinking about. Maybe this is tangential, but at uh, Mori Art Museum, we have the rock exhibition. Uh, and uh, we were asked uh, by the uh, priest uh, uh, of a temple to represent something for 1,000 years. So art is something that is lasting. So design and art, are they different? Design and art, are they different? We were having that conversation internally earlier. Harasan, what do you think? If you start talking about the difference Art and design, how are they different? I'm afraid we can have that uh, rich conversation talking about that. Designers, I mean, if you are uh, going to have that kind of such object, uh, we need to be sharing that. And therefore, people will be thinking, why do we need that there? People will think about what is missing, and then they'll come up with the answer as to why it has to be built there. So when you have a shared view as to why that is needed there, you uh, can have that design or arch architecture. Whereas art, you don't have uh, that kind of consensus. The artist comes up with this idea, and all of a sudden, it's there. So in our case, uh, we have to think about consensus, whereas in the case of uh, artists, it could surprise everyone, taking pictures, having lunch. So uh, this uh, endeavor uh, by artists, how do you interpret that? Or curators are working together to have more sculptures to add interpretation. So this surprise by an artist uh, will be uh, carried uh, through, uh, followed up uh, by other people. Whereas in the case of design, it's about collective thinking. What do we need? So here is an issue. Uh, what's the solution to that? So uh, there has to be a resonance uh, between uh, the society and design. So I, th I don't think it's a matter of which is better. Design, or d Nissan car, I think, is the same here. In the case of art, you have total freedom. You can play in that space. Within the confinements of society, people live there, and you are engaged in activities. And that makes up a society, whereas artists, creators, designers, uh, we go in and out of that confinement in our created work. And eventually, uh, you have to adjust uh, to uh, that uh, structure system. But the initial idea uh, might be way outside of that uh, framework. And I think that uh, is the beauty of artists or creators. So ideas. If you are assuming the current society as the starting point, that's already outdated. Maybe you can change the contours with your new ideas or to do something that is outside of that contour so that people will be more aware of that contours. That's easy to do in the world of uh, expression, and I think that's what we need to do. And that creates a new sense of beauty or aesthetics. Yes. So um, this, uh, the, it's true for the use of technology. We should not be the user of technology. Uh, that's user of technology as the promoters use technology in a reverse way or to be a critique of technology. I think that's the role and mission of a creator. I wonder if you have any questions you'd like to ask of each other. Anyone? No? I have a question I'd like to ask of Tim. 
Tokyo Olympics are coming. What can we do here in Tokyo to make it more interesting? So 60 years, back in 1964, uh, when we held the first Tokyo Olympics, uh, we were at the start of a rapid economic development. But that's the uh, past. But again, we have Tokyo Olympics in our future as well. People talk about uh, the 2025 issue, 2050 issue. So there are so many challenges that face us, and we'll be hosting the Olympics as we have to address those uh, challenges, which might give us a good opportunity. I think uh, Americans are only looking at China. And if you're looking at Asia, I think Americans are talking about Cambodia. So I think most of the Americans are bypassing Tokyo, looking beyond. Uh, but uh, so how does Tokyo look like from your perspective? Any advice? I'm not sure I'm qualified to give <laughs> advice. But um, I mean, I've been coming to Tokyo for 25 years, and uh, it's always been a place of great inspiration for me. I mean, there may be a parallel, actually, to that which we just experienced with the London Olympics. If you think about it, the first London Olympics was at kind of the end of the great empire um, in the 1920s, and uh, in fact, it was earlier than that, um, and uh, it represented that. The last L London Olympics represented a sort of a reinvention of London as a place of kind of communal spirit, really, I think, and more than anything, it was low cost. Uh, very simple from an infrastructure standpoint, but, uh, but uh, somehow it unlocked uh, the community in London in a way that it kind of welcomed the world in in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. And uh, I think there may be a parallel here that, that the last Olympics for Tokyo was about establishing Japan as this great technological and industrial nation. Um, and that this time around is an opportunity to not rebrand. I don't think this is the moment to rebrand anything. I think it's a moment, it's a moment to um, uh, uh, behave differently. And it's a, it's a moment to be differently in the, in, in, in the world. And the sense that I, that I, I get that it is perhaps it's about, it is almost about individual creativity, that, that, that what the world perceives Japan to be, which are, which are these, which is to be a place of that creates remarkable institutions, remarkable companies, but in fact, what Japan is a place of rem, of remarkable people, and 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 remarkable thoughtfulness and re, and remarkable creativity and remarkable innovation. So much of it is actually invisible to the outside world, and uh, revealing that and making that transparent in the, so many very different ways. Some of, the, uh, some of which we've seen examples of this afternoon, but there are many, many thousands of other ways in which that might, that might be possible. So maybe this should be the transparent Olympics, the Olympics of accessibility, the Olympics of looking inward in order to look outward. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I, I do believe it's, it's, a, it's an exciting and, and, and uh, important opportunity. And do you think you can do it? I mean, Japan can do that, realize that? Live up to your expectation? The news is that, uh, as, as uh, Kenya just said, um, maybe the world's been bypassing Japan for a while now, so there's an opportunity to surprise, right? Nobody's looking. And so, uh, so I think, I mean, again, I mean, after the China Olympics, uh, many people were thinking London Olympics were going to be a disaster because it was not going to be this big, grandiose, kind of almost 20th century branding of a country or a city in the way that Beijing was. Um, and there were many people predicting London would be a big failure. And instead, it was a remarkable success because it took a very different attitude, one that was surprising to the world. So I guess my single piece of advice would be surprising to the world. Mm -hmm. don't, be, don't be what everybody else expects it, mm -hmm. expects it to be. Then you can only be successful, I think. So Nawasan, Harasan, if you do the good job, I think we can live up to that expectation. I'm afraid we have to close here. Maybe we can take a question or two from the floor. Anyone, a question or two? No? Not at all. How about a uh, gentleman over there? 
Uh, thank you very much for like coming and talking. And I actually want to uh, actually have a question for Tim. And uh, I'm kind kindly I've been like preparing for my startup, and probably I'm heading to like London, and so I need to like design pretty much everything. So what do you always keep in mind when you design? I mean, it's hard to define like the design, but what do you always keep in mind? You know, it, it, you're right. It's hard to define a single thing um, to keep in mind, other than uh, keeping in mind everything. Um, does, uh, design is a system, you know, um, and whatever you do is a system. Your business will be a system. Your business will be made of many elements, not just products, but people. Uh, not just software, but hardware. Not 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 uh, not just things, but processes uh, and messages and. The, the more you're able to keep that system in your, in your mind and, and think about how each of these elements interacts with each other and how you can design each of them to work to, to create a greater whole, the more, I believe the more successful your, 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 your adventure will be. The mistake that many people make with, with, when they think about design particularly in a startup, is to think, I have one thing to worry about. It's the, the product. I just need to get the design of the product right. But that's only the tiny, first, the tiny first step. And even if you get that right, if you get the design of everything else wrong, then your venture won't grow. It won't be sustainable. It won't survive in the marketplace. It won't raise funding, whatever. The, it'll, you, will, you will find many, many, many problems. So remember that you have to design everything. Cool. Thanks. Anyone else? Any other questions? Looks like none. Well, we covered a broad range of uh, subjects, so there's no way I can summarize what we have been talking for the last two hours. Design is not just one thing. It has many aspects. I think we're living in a world where design is applied to everything. Art is becoming more, more broad as well. Uh, Nawasan's work include large public art. Uh, we see more works of art in the streets. And uh, I want to installation. I see that. I saw that. It is uh, that foam uh, installation by Noah-san. It's gigantic, uh, large enough to fill this room. And when I walked into that room, I felt like uh, flying on an airplane during the nighttime. Uh, and I felt like uh, there were clouds underneath. I understand that it will be exhibited for 10 more days? Yes. In fact, under the low pressure system, that foam doubles in size. So you might want to take a look at it. When the typhoon is approaching, it's going to look more exciting. So once again, thank you very much, everyone. And this concludes the session. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Tim Brown, Mr. Kea Nawahara, uh, Mr. Nawa, and Mr. Francois Anko. Thank you very much and the moderator, Mr. Nanjo. Thank you very much. With this, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude Culture and Creativity Session 2, Day 2 of Innovative City Forum, commemorating the 10th anniversary of Rapongi Hills. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.